Hi there friends, we're um, here, talk eight in Exodus. And um, as in the previous couple of weeks, I'm giving you slightly more detail um, over the big sweep of Exodus than you get in the notes um, for your connect group. Um, and that's really to try to give you a bit of bigger context as well as, as well as to draw out some slightly different themes. So we are going to look at uh, four more plagues, uh, boils, hail, locust and darkness and try and draw out some application and implication for what God's doing. So the first thing I want you to notice, this is in chapters 9 and 10, that the plagues kind of get more intense. Um, they will ultimately climax in the death of the firstborn, which will be the very thing uh, that God uses to, to, to rescue Israel from slavery, and we'll come to that next week. Um, I want you also to notice the sort of waning influence of the magicians. They're no longer able to replicate um, the plagues. And also even the advisors are starting to get a bit exasperated with this and trying to encourage Pharaoh on a different course of action. Pharaoh himself oscillates and vacillates between repentance, which is very short lived, and then belligerence. Um, and I wonder if you've noticed that he hardens his heart but God hardens his heart. So Pharaoh is culpable for his unbelief, but actually God is also sovereign and he's, he's hardening the choices that Pharaoh makes to achieve his own purposes, in fact, as well. And again, as before, I'm going to take the passages as read um, here in chapter nine, verses eight to 12, the plague of boils. Um, I hope you're not eating your dinner while you're watching this, <clears throat> but uh, notice, again the intensification that you know that they're becoming um more personally impactful for, for for the people of egypt um people have noted that so in verse eight moses and aaron are told to take a handful of soot from the furnace moses to throw it in the air in the presence of pharaoh and it will become fine dust of the whole land and boils will break out um there's a little bit of irony here because this all really started with um, the, the forced labour of the Egyptians by the slave drivers in Egypt and uh, the making of uh, the bricks. And then uh, actually when Moses first asked to take the people to go and sacrifice and worship the Lord, um, Pharaoh made the making the bricks harder by making them collect uh, their own material for it. And this is the dust from the kilns where they made the bricks. Um, now, now, as it were, all coming back to judge uh, the people of Egypt. <clears throat> Notice the second thing in this particular one, verse 11, the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils that were on them and on all the Egyptians. They, they can't stand before Moses, possibly because they're so covered in boils that it's so uncomfortable. But perhaps also there's a bit of irony here. They can't, they can't stand up against Moses because Moses' God is so much more powerful than the Egyptians. But, verse 12, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said to Moses. So that's plague six. Plague seven, the hail. Actually, this is quite a long section, verses 13 to 35 of chapter nine. Um, why? I don't know, we can speculate, but there's a lot more detail about the destructive nature of hail, um, destroying the crops. Interestingly, also, it's targeted. So in verse um, 25, throughout all Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both the people and the animals. It beat down everything growing in the fields and stripped every tree. But only in Goshen did it not hail where the people of Israel lived. Uh, they, they were spared. We can take comfort, I think, from that, that God actually does know how to rescue his people. And though the world may fall under the judgment of God, God can still preserve his own people if they remain faithful to him. But let's look in a bit more detail here. So verse 14, I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people so you may know that there's no one like me in all the earth. Um, God is coming in all the might of his judgment and God will reveal himself in, in power so that they should at least know that when they are judged, it is because God is both able to and he's right to do so. 
the full force of his judgment. And even in verses 15 and 16, we note that Pharaoh himself is under the direction of God. For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Even this terrible tyrant is actually a puppet of God's plans. So he's, he's limited in what he can do. He can't, even his magicians can't produce uh, all of these plagues to, to, to mimic them. Um, and then, you know, this terrible hell still will fall upon Egypt. Um, they're given the order, verse 19, to bring your livestock and everything you have in the field to a place of shelter because the hail will fall upon every person and animal that's not been brought in and is still out there in the field. But only those who fear the Lord, verse 20, obey. And again, we just have Pharaoh, and we're going to see this several times over the next couple of plagues, showing a degree of fear of the Lord or degree of repentance. Um, so Look at verse 27, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron, this time I have sinned, he said, the Lord is right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Pray to the Lord, for we have had enough thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. You would think that sounds great, doesn't it? You know, um, I've sinned, God's right, pray for my forgiveness. But actually, when when it's withdrawn, Pharaoh, verse 34, saw that the rain, the hell and thunder had stopped. He sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts. So, you know, there's a world of difference, isn't there, between remorse over the things you've done wrong, um, a desire that you won't get the ill effects of your sin and actually genuine repentance, which is directed at seeking after God. And, and I think probably Pharaoh here is much more concerned about being relieved from the plague than he is actually truly searching after God. And we'll find this theme repeated in the next few plagues. So how about plague eight, then the locusts, chapter 10, verses one to 20. Um, again, throughout the Bible, locusts are often a picture of God's judgment. So you could re read Joel chapters one and two, um, where there's just this fearful, devastating effect that locusts can just come and strip everything away. And actually, they can do that at the command of God. And notice the beginning of this chapter. The Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials, so that I may perform these signs of mine among them. That you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, and that you may know that I am the Lord. This plague, and indeed all of the plagues, will become a teaching point for the future generations of Israel to remind them that God is powerful over the forces of evil and the forces of nature. Um, and actually, of course, we will find out more about this as we go on. But the whole of the Exodus is the teaching paradigm of how God knows how to save his people by judging the wicked and rescuing his his own. Um, and so. Moses is told you need you need to make sure you teach this stuff to your kids to remind them of how powerful God is and that he is able to do what he says. So it happens. Uh, Moses and Aaron go again before Pharaoh and explain that, you know, if you won't let him go, you won't let us go. Um, locusts will come to your country and devour everything and fill your houses and the houses of your officials. And then verse seven, Pharaoh's officials said to him, how long will this man be a snare to us? Let the people go so that they may worship the Lord their God. Do you not realise that Egypt is ruined? There's kind of no, no more debate. Even the officials have had enough. You've got to let these people go. They're actually devastating this land. And as long as you disobey their God, uh, these terrible things will come upon us. So we find, uh, um, we find Moses sort of repenting again um 
verse 16, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now forgive my sin once more and pray to the Lord your God to take this deadly plague away. Moses left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord and the Lord changed the direction of the wind, blew the locust out into the Red Sea. Some irony there because that will be the place where actually the people of Egypt pursuing God's people will die. Um, not a locust was left anywhere in Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let the Israelites go. So that's locusts. Now, darkness, um, chapter 10, verse 21 to 29. There's a degree of brevity uh, in the description here, not as long as the description of the hail and the locusts, but there's also, uh, again, a sense of greater intensity. This is the penultimate plague before the death of the firstborn. Um, probably uh, indicating a couple of things. One, that actually Israel's God is even more powerful than the, than the Egyptian sun God, in whom they held so much esteem. Um, God is able to snuff out the lights of their feeble idol. But also darkness is, is associated with, with chaos very often. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, you know, there was chaos over the, over the face of the earth, as it were, and God said, let there be light. Uh, this big contrast all the way through the Bible, that, that darkness is a sign of absence of God. Or, or more, darkness is a sign of, of judgment. So the people that walked in darkness, Isaiah chapter 9, have seen a great light. On them has the favour of the Lord been shown. Um, and what a terrible picture this is, that as it were, the brilliance of the sun is shrouded and the people live in darkness because they've tried to snuff out the light of God. So, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, you, you would think that finally Pharaoh and his officials are getting the message that, that God is powerful and that God will do all that he can to rescue his people. But note these three things by way of conclusion. The first, and this has come through actually on with all of these plagues, is that creation serves its maker. Um, God remains powerful over this world that he has made. You think um, on to uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, where you have Elijah before the prophets of Baal. And you remember the, the, the prophets of Baal are crying out to their gods. They're cutting themselves and they're, they're calling for their gods to answer by fire. And Elijah says, you know, go and get some water poured over all of the, the sacrifices. And he simply prays to God and God sends fire. Uh, down on the sacrifices. Uh, the, the prophets of Baal, they are unable to do anything to change the minds or the actions of their gods. Now, we don't control God, but when we call out to God, he in mercy answers our prayer, and even here, answering in judgment upon the people's enemies. And the created order serves its creator by obeying. The other thing that points you forward, actually, even beyond this picture of darkness as chaos or darkness as judgment, is to Golgotha. So you remember that when Jesus was hanging on the cross on that first Good Friday between noon and 3 p.m., that the, the whole land was covered in darkness, that there was even the splitting of the rocks or earthquakes, and all of these sort of terrible signs to such an extent that in both Luke and Matthew's account, that the, the people are fearful at the wonders that are happening as, as it were, God uh, allows his son to bear the sin of the world. It goes black and dark. Um, so, you know, this is not some nice children's story. I mean, we, we turn to Exodus and we read through the plagues and we set our kids' fire, uh, imagination on fire which is it could in one respect, but it's actually all about who is this God? God is big and powerful. God is able to save. God made this world and he still rules it. Now, it doesn't answer all our questions about why we have natural disasters, why we have a coronavirus sweeping this world and so on. But we should go away with a great confidence that God is sovereign and that God is powerful. However, it's still mysterious. There's no answers as to why 
God and acts in this way, why he saves some and not others. But God, we're told, is able to save those who are his, to those who cry out to him. If you want to look at this in a bit more detail, why don't you look at Psalm 77, um, where the psalmist cries out to the Lord in distress um, and finds that, yes, God answers, but it's no quick and easy fix. Listen to um, what he says uh, in Psalm 77, verse 10. Then I thought, to this I will appeal, the years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. Yes, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty hand, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. There's a sense of reverence and awe amongst God's people, the psalmist reflects it here, that, you know, God is mighty to save, God is powerful, but he still remains inscrutable. We cannot fully know him. Um, we, we worship him for everything that he does, but yet we're bowed and humbled that he should act in that way. And I wonder whether you think that also about that wonderful mystery of God saving and rescuing you. Why, Lord, why did you choose even me? even though I was some aware of my sin, yet you rescued me. And why, why have you not chosen somebody else? That's also mysterious. But Lord, your ways are inscrutable. And I worship you that the, the sovereign God on the throne, who still rules his creation and still knows how to save his people, as you did all of those centuries ago, as you rescued God's people out of Egypt into your land of promise. Thank that you did it again at the cross that you save us and rescue us and even now bring us into life eternal. What a wonderful God we are. You are. What a wonderful God. And we praise you. And we worship you. And we adore you. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, your ways are powerful and inscrutable. Thank you, Lord, for the wonders that you performed amongst your people uh, through Moses and Aaron uh, bringing to nothing all the plans of Pharaoh and his officials and his magicians. And Lord, that you knew how to rescue your people then and that you know how to do it today. So we cry to you, Lord, to do that. We think about those who we know, Lord, who don't yet know you. Please, Lord, would you open their blind eyes to see that you are the sovereign king of the universe. In Jesus' name. Amen.